Hello again. Now we are on part B of chapter 2 and we are going to be starting on slide number 41 and this will complete the discussion of chemical bonds and then we will highlight some of the principles of water and a discussion of pH. So here's a figure that shows a summary of the three types of chemical bonds that we discussed so far. The ionic bond, which is a when a there's a complete transfer of electrons from one atom to another. It results in separate ions or charged particles. The example that was given to us, we have sodium chloride. And this is when a sodium uh, atom gives up it's one electron that's in its valence shell. It gives it up to the, a chlorine atom that has seven electrons in its valence shell. So when the chlorine atom picks that electron up, it will have a complete outer shell. The only thing is, remember then the sodium uh, atom will end up with one less electron, so it has a positive charge, and the chlorine atom has one extra electron, and that's why it becomes a chloride ion, which has a negative charge. The next bond that was discussed was the nonpolar covalent bond, where you have an equal sharing of electrons between two atoms. The charge is balanced among the atoms, and the example that was given to us was carbon dioxide. There's a carbon atom here and two oxygen atoms. And these, are, these electron pairs are shared equally. Um, in fact, there's actually uh, a double bond from this carbon atom to this oxygen atom, and then from this carbon atom, of course, over to the other oxygen atom. There's, uh, earlier, there was other molecules that were discussed, such as O2, oxygen gas, and N2, nitrogen gas. Those were also nonpolar covalent bonds. But then the last bond that was discussed was the polar covalent bond. This is when you have an unequal sharing of electrons and it results with a slight negative charge, delta negative, at one end of the molecule and a slight positive charge, delta positive, at the other end. And the example is the water molecule where you have an oxygen atom over here that has a slight negative charge and then by the hydrogen atoms there will be a slight positive charge because the electrons are shared unequally. They actually spend a lot more time over toward this oxygen atom. And that is a very important type of bond. There's one more type of uh, chemical bond that we need to discuss. I would like you to know these four types. The fourth one being the hydrogen bond. A hydrogen bond is an, the attractive force between an electropositive hydrogen atom of one molecule and the electronegative atom of another. It's not really a true bond, but it acts as an intramolecular bond, meaning between molecules, and the example will be um, water, and that is when one um, water molecule here, this is actually a polar covalent bond if you will remember. When it interacts with other water molecules we have intramolecular bonding here between this water molecule and this water molecule and then between this water molecule and this one, this one, and this one, etc. And so that actually is why water has certain properties such as being cohesive and adhesive where these water molecules are attracted to one another. And you can see that the slightly positive ends, the delta positive ends um, of the water molecules are going to become aligned with the slightly negative ends of other water molecules. So here's the slightly negative oxygen atom on this water molecule. It's attracted to the slightly positive side of this one where we have our hydrogen atoms. Here's a slight positive uh, end of this one water molecule and that's attracted to the slightly negative uh, end of this one, etc. And those between the water molecules are called hydrogen bonds. And this is showing um, how important in nature hydrogen bonding is, particularly with water. 
here you can see that the water strider can walk on a pond because of the high surface tension of the water. And this is a result of the combined strength of water's hydrogen bonds. And so the insect is so light, it can actually skim right across the surface of that water. Um, a long time ago, there was an old commercial for Maxwell House Coffee, and they used to say a cup and a half of, of flavor, and it looked like kind of magic where the coffee was being poured and it would go way up like that. Now, obviously, surface tension does not extend quite to that extent, but if you were to carefully pour drop by drop a liquid into this cup, you would see a little bubble forming and because of the surface tension of the liquid. So chemical reactions, they may be synthesis reactions. Synthesis, remember, is making something. It's building up something um, larger from smaller subunits. We call that anabolic. Sometimes you uh, might want to think of like anabolic steroids are those um, hormones that actually help build muscles like with bodybuilders. Anabolic, building up. Decomposition reactions are also called catabolic or breaking down larger molecules into smaller ones. Exchange reactions involve both. So this figure actually gives you uh, some examples. You can see a synthesis reaction when smaller uh, particles are bonded together to form larger, more complex molecules. And you can see here some little amino acids are going to be joined together to form a protein molecule. You may remember from your fundamentals of biology that the first level here, when, pro when amino acids are joined together, we actually call this a polypeptide because these bonds are actually called peptide bonds. And what is, what's another name for a synthesis reaction? Yes, anabolic reaction, building up. A decomposition or catabolic reaction is when the bonds are broken in larger molecules resulting in smaller or less complex molecules. The example here is when uh, the large uh, the poly, poly, um, polysaccharide glycogen is broken down into smaller glucose molecules. And this happens um, actually in our liver. We have stores of glycogen so that if our blood sugar, our blood glucose level were to drop, our body can start breaking down liver glycogen in order to free up those glucose molecules to keep our blood glucose within a balance. And also we have some glycogen stores in our skeletal muscle and we need to have more energy for muscle contraction. Uh, decomposition reactions, of course, happen. Uh, uh, an enormous number and variety of these reactions happen during the breakdown of nutrients, of food, in the digestive system, in the GI tract. Exchange reactions. This is when bonds are going to be both made and broken, um, and they're paired together. Um, it's also called a displacement reaction. An example being when ATP, or adenosine triphosphate, transfers its terminal phosphate group. Terminal means that the last one, the end one. It will, ATP will transfer this phosphate group to a glucose molecule. Phosphate groups actually has a phosphorus atom with four oxygen atoms, and this group of, um, we call it a phosphate group, gets transferred to a glucose molecule that's um, phosphorylating it. And so what happens when the adenosine triphosphate transfers this phosphate group to glucose, what you have left is adenosine diphosphate. Remember this uh, prefix di means two. So you have your two phosphate groups, adenosine diphosphate, and the other phosphate group was transferred to the glucose molecule. So this one actually broke down this molecule to a smaller one, but then built this molecule up to a larger one into glucose phosphate. Energy flow in chemical reactions. So chemical reactions are either exergonic or endergonic. Exergonic reactions release energy and endergonic reactions require an energy input. So you can see here, this is representing energy that's released from an exergonic reaction um, will be used to drive uh, building up 
ATP from ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and a phosphate group. Um, this, is going, this phosphate group will be joined on to the ADP to form ATP. And if you remember, ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is our energy currency or energy money, basically, of the cell. And ATP is used when it's going to be broken down back into ADP with a phosphate group. This is going to be used to drive endergonic reactions reactions that require energy input, such as muscle contraction, etc. All chemical reactions are theoretically reversible, and they will um, come to what we call a chemical equilibrium. But many biological reactions, those within living cells, become irreversible due to the energy requirements. Um, it, it takes a long time for these chemical reactions to um, happen on their own. So enzymes, remember, are going to catalyze or speed up these uh, chemical reactions. And so if we don't have enough en enzymes, um, that can actually um, cause this chemical reaction to slow down a bit. So, but then, so you need enough enzymes, you need enough of the nutrient or the molecule that is going to be worked on and then there's also limits to the removal of the of the byproducts. So we have we can have an, an accumulation of waste products. So in living cells, um, there is we have a special direction of chemical reactions, special needs of the cells in order to achieve these chemical reactions. They all will require, each chemical reaction requires a specific enzyme, and there needs to be some way to remove the products of those chemical reactions or to deal with them. Biochemistry is the study of the chemical composition and reactions of living cells. And this is a little figure representing an animal cell. Um, Biochemistry involves inorganic compounds as well as organic compounds. Remember, a compound is a molecule that has two or more types of atoms. Um, there may be a molecule, such as oxygen gas, O2, that's a molecule but not a compound. But anytime you have um, a, a molecule that has two or more different kinds of atoms, that is called a compound. So with biochemistry, it involves inorganic compounds and molecules, simpler um, molecules, and also organic compounds. Both of these are equally essential for life. We're going to be talking about organic compounds. But first, let's take a look at the some of the principles of water. Water is in living organisms. It's the most abundant inorganic compound in living cells, um, comprising 60 to 80 percent of the volume of living cells, and it's very, very important due to its properties. I love this little bubble hat on the spider there. Some of the properties of water, you have high heat capacity. Water absorbs and releases heat. And this prevents sudden changes in temperature. This is critical in nature because the air temperature can change very quickly. Water also has a high heat of vaporization, which we also call evaporation. Um, it requires a large amount of heat in order to um, evaporate water. You can see the boiling point right here, 100 degrees Celsius, or 210 or 212 degrees um, water. They have 210 somewhere around there. Anyway, this requires, uh, in order to evaporate water though, that's quite a bit of heat, so that makes water very useful as a cooling mechanism. Properties of water also include water being an amazing transport medium, also reactivity. This uh, refers to the fact that in water, water molecules can actually be used in chemical reactions that break down and build up other molecules. With a larger molecule, when you break it down into two smaller molecules, um, the term hydrolysis is referring to the fact that it uses a water molecule, an H2O molecule, in, in order to separate um, two smaller subunits of a larger uh, molecule. 
dehydration synthesis is when a molecule of water is basically cleaved off of the smaller um, molecules in order to join them together to become a larger one. We will see how that happens later on. And actually, it's a hydrogen from one of them and a, a, a OH or hydroxyl from the other one. When you take that away, it provides a means to join those two smaller uh, molecules together into a larger one. Water also is great as a cushioning um, medium. And because water is polar, it dissolves and dissociates ionic or polar substances. Dissociate means they come apart. Um, it does this through forming what we call hydration layers, which is illustrated right here. You have the dissociation of salt in water. So you take a, crystal, a salt crystal, sodium chloride, and what happens is these little water molecules, because they are polar, they will surround each of these ions. And so this will dissolve that from the salt crystal. You can see a sodium ion right here. It is positive, so the negative ends of the water molecules will surround that sodium ion to separate it from the chloride ion. And you can see the chloride ion is negative, and it's the positive ends of the water molecules right here that are surrounding it. And it will separate it from the sodiums. So this is dissolving that sodium chloride in water. Salts. Ionic compounds, uh, as you can see, dissociate into ions in water. Ions conduct electrical currents in solution, and they play specialized roles in body functions. Ions are basically our electricity. It, it makes us alive. It's the difference between us and a corpse or a, a cadaver. Physiology involves um, a lot of uh, chemical reactions, and a lot of this has to do with ions in solution. And we come back to this during um, the study of the nervous system and muscles. So cations, other than the hydrogen ion, and anions, other than the hydroxyl ion, um, are considered salts. And you might notice a hydrogen here and a hydroxyl here, when this joins together, that's really what makes a water molecule. And what happens is when the electron takes off from this hydrogen atom, it will join the hydroxyl, the, the oxygen atom, and the other hydrogen atom. And so this hydrogen atom becomes a hydrogen proton. And this, these two atoms right here, become the hydroxyl. Um, and it's an anion. It has a negative charge to it. So common salts in the body are sodium chloride. They dissociate into, it dissociates into sodium and chloride. Um, and then you have potassium chloride. It dissociates into a potassium ion, a cation, and the chloride ion, an anion, negatively charged ion, and even calcium chloride. So you can see here that calcium is a cation. It actually has a, a charge of plus two, and then you have uh, two chlorine chloride ions released. So it's CaCl2. Acids and bases. So both electrolytes will ionize and dissociate in water. Acids are actually proton donors. They release hydrogen ion in solution. Bases are proton acceptors. So bases will take up hydrogen ion from solution. Free hydrogen ion of a solution is measured on what we call a pH scale. As the free hydrogen ion increases, acidity increases. As free hydrogen ion decreases, the alkalinity increases. The pH scale is actually a negative log of the hydrogen ion, the, the moles per liter. So as the concentration of hydrogen ion goes up, 
the number on the pH scale goes down. And so we're going to be looking at this pH scale. Remember, it's in the range of 0 to 14, and the pH scale is logarithmic. In other words, a pH of 5 is 10 times more acidic than a pH 6 solution. Remember, an acidic solution has an increased concentration of hydrogen ion. This will decrease the pH, and any pH less than 7 is acidic. A neutral solution has an equal numbers of hydrogen ion and hydroxide, hydroxyl ion, and its pH is 7 because pure water has um, equal numbers of the hydrogen uh, ion and the hydroxyl ion, and it happens to be dissociating at 10 to the minus 7 molar. An alkaline solution, or basic solution, has decreased concentration of hydrogen ion, so there's an increase in pH, increase in pH, and that means that the pH will be greater than 7. So here's your figure, and you can see on the left it's concentration of moles per liter. Um, when we have, let's start with 7, okay, so you've got your hydroxyl ion, your hydrogen ion over here. Hydroxyl is a negative charge. The hydrogen ion, which is actually just a proton, if you remember that the hydrogen atom is basically a proton and an electron. The electron took off, joined up with the uh, the other oxygen and hydrogen atom, and now all we have left here is a positively charged hydrogen ion, so there's a proton. In, in, in pure water, there's 10 to the minus 7 of the hydroxyl ions and 10 to the minus 7 of the hydrogen ions, so this is neutral. Now, if we put some excess hydrogen ion into this water, now it becomes a solution, um, the more we have hydrogen ion added, the, more, the lower the number on the pH scale. So actually these numbers, if you see minus 7, minus 6, minus 5, these are actually getting closer to 1. So the number of, of hydrogen ions is actually increasing as we become more and more acidic. Um, as you have fewer and fewer hydrogen ion, or in other words, there's more of the hydroxyl ion, you're getting a, a solution that's increasingly basic, and you, you can see that the um, number on the pH scale is increasing from O greater than 7. Um, so here's neutral. Blood is actually slightly alkaline, 7.4 approximately. Egg white, household bleach, household ammonia, oven cleaner, etc., are very alkaline or basic. And then when we go below 7, we've got acidic solutions. We've got black coffee, wine, etc. Look at this. Gastric juice. The juices in the stomach have a pH of at around 2. And of course it varies depending on uh, what you've just eaten and other factors. Um, and in either extreme, it, whether it's hydrochloric acid or stomach acid or something like oven cleaner or sodium hydroxide, these are caustic to human tissues. So pH is really important in the environment of the, uh, within our internal environment and external environment. Um, neutralization is when you mix acids and bases and you'll, then you form water and a salt. And this is showing, of course, acetic acid, vinegar um, with baking soda. And when you mix them together, they will form um, water, actually. So you join the hydrogen ion and the hydroxyl ion to make water. Acid-base homeostasis. Again, it's really important to keep the pH um, in our body and on our surface of our body to... Um, within uh, a particular level. Um, obviously within the body uh, we have systems that maintain homeostasis of pH of the blood particularly. Um, so any pH change will interfere with cell function and it may damage living tissue. Even a slight change in pH can be fatal. P 
pH is going to be regulated by the kidneys, the lungs, and chemical buffers. And again, that word is homeostasis. And the body has ways to maintain a very tight control of blood pH. This is showing in the blood. Um, it's about 7.4. It can vary a little bit from here. But if it gets extremely alkaline or basic, um, you can die. We call this alkalosis, when the blood becomes very alkaline. On the other hand, if the blood becomes too acidic, starting right about here and becoming um, lower on the pH scale, it, this can lead to death as well. And again, our kidneys, our lungs, and chemical buffers will help maintain blood pH to a, a certain limit. Buffers resist abrupt and large swings in pH. You may have remembered if, you take, if you've taken chemistry discussion about buffers. But just keep in mind that a buffer can release hydrogen ion if the pH rises. Remember, if the pH rises, it's becoming more alkaline. So if you have a buffer present, it can release hydrogen ion to neutralize that to a, do, to a degree. Um, a buffer will also bind hydrogen ion if the pH falls into that acidic range. Um, a buffer will convert a strong or completely dissociated acid or base into a weak one or slightly dissociated ones. So this will resist, again, abrupt or large swings in pH. The example is the carbonic acid bicarbonate system in the blood, which we'll come back to much later in Bio 264 when we talk about the respiratory system. And that is the end of Part B. Have a great day, and I will see you with Part C of Chapter 2.